Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Hewitt. I'm super excited to be here with you today. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting to you my talk, Airflow and Kubernetes, Container Engineer Workflows. Um, and I'm going to give you some context on me first. Um, I'm a software engineer at Nielsen. Um, you can kind of better classify what I do more as what a site reliability engineer might do or a DevOps engineer. But since I've got here at Nielsen, I've been deep diving into Kubernetes and finding a way to transfer our ETLs to Kubernetes. And we decided to use Airflow. So I've been working with Airflow a ton this past year. OK, so um, let me get to the agenda for today. OK, so today I'm going to start with a brief overview of Kubernetes. And I'm also going to go over a core concept of Kubernetes that is fundamental for you to understand the later concept I'm going to talk about. After this, I'm going to talk about Airflow's integrations with Kubernetes, essentially the piece of architecture that enables this integration. From here, I'm going to talk about the deployment of Airflow and Kubernetes and how we actually do that at Nielsen. After this, I'm going to talk about the technologies enabled from this integration and the benefits of those technologies. From here, I'm going to talk about the DAG development transformations we had to go through to actually enable using Kubernetes within our DAGs and using those new technologies. And then last, I'm going to finish with the future of Airflow and Kubernetes. So essentially, some features in Airflow 2.0 we're looking forward to to help enable these technologies and make them more effective. Kubernetes, what is it? Um, Kubernetes is a container orchestrator that uses declarative configuration and automation to actually maintain and manage your containers. Kubernetes is very scalable. The infrastructure or the nodes can scale in and out either automatically or manually. For example, we use Amazon's managed Kubernetes service and under an auto scaling group. So we can scale up within as little as three minutes automatically. So it's really quickly scalable. Also, you can scale the containers on Kubernetes. You can also do that in an automated or manual manner. In an automated manner, you can do it based on system level metrics or even L7 level. L7 metrics. Um, there's also components in Kubernetes that keep track of the amount of replicas of your containers you have. So essentially, if you have an extra container that's actually not doing any work and it's just sort of sitting there taking up resources, Kubernetes will actually delete that for you and you won't have to worry about it. Kubernetes is also very highly available. So you can easily integrate health checks in your, into your containers. Um, it's also self-healing. So essentially, if one of your containers fails, Kubernetes will actually spin up a new one automatically in a very little time. Kubernetes also supports zero downtime rolling updates. So essentially, if you want to change the image um, in one of your containers, Kubernetes will handle bringing up that new container and then switching over the traffic to that new container and then actually deleting the old one. And it enables this with zero downtime. So it's very, very automated and useful. Um, Kubernetes is also very extensible. You can use multiple schedulers. You can use the native scheduler, your own, or, multi or uh, both of those at the same time. Um, it also has dynamic webhooks. So you can further validate or even modify resources that are submitted to your Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes is also very usable. Um, it supports APIs for a plethora of languages. With the Python API, we've actually added a feature to our Kubernetes and Airflow, or our Airflow and Kubernetes deployment. Um, and most importantly, Kubernetes is usable essentially as an executor for other platforms. So these platforms can actually use Kubernetes as their own infrastructure. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit on how Airflow uses that. And then GitLab also actually um, has this available for its CI CD platform. The fundamental piece of Kubernetes I wanted to mention is the pod. So the pod is the canonical unit of Kubernetes, essentially. Um, it's the abstraction of a group of containers or a single container that represents a process on your cluster. You can easily expose the containers within your pod, whether you specify that in your declarative configuration, or you just want to use a simple Kubernetes CLI command that will call the API and expose it locally. Each pod has its own network namespace, essentially making all those containers within that pod reachable by local hosts. And then pods on the cluster see each other as essentially different computers, but Kubernetes handles actually the 
how the networking goes from pod to pod. So um, you don't really have to worry about that. And it's pretty much all handled by Kubernetes, which is great. Um, also pod support both ephemeral and persistent storage. Um, ephemeral is supported to be shared between containers in the same pod and persistent can do that, but as well as being shared between containers in different pods and it will persist past the lifetime of the pod. Okay, the Kubernetes executor, what is it actually doing for Airflow? So essentially the Kubernetes executor is that piece of Airflow architecture that enables the integration with Kubernetes and the use of its infrastructure as its own. Um, essentially it's made up of a bunch of Python API calls to the Kubernetes API, which is another benefit of Kubernetes very strong and supported API, well supported API. Um, so I wanted to give you a visual example as what's actually going on here with the Kubernetes executor when it wants to create a task now. Um, so essentially imagine the Kubernetes or the Airflow scheduler wants to start a task. So it essentially wants to make an Airflow worker to run this task. So all it does is send a request to create an Airflow worker to the API server in Kubernetes, which is essentially the point of contact in that cluster. So once that actual API call is processed and approved, um, Kubernetes will create an Airflow worker on demand. So essentially now you have workers on demand. Um, so say the Airflow scheduler wants to run two more tasks parallelly, um, so it schedules two more Airflow workers. Um, so simply add two more workers and now you have three workers at your hands within a few seconds. Um, so now imagine, let's say the latest task we added actually passed and it's essentially finished and no longer being used. Those resources do not need to be taken up by Airflow anymore. So let's just see what happens. So essentially Kubernetes will delete that Airflow worker and that resources that the Airflow worker was using is freed up for other processes in Kubernetes or maybe even another Airflow worker to spin up. So essentially now you have on-demand and, uh, and automatically destroyed Airflow workers. So um, it's very useful to use this executor. Um, let's talk about some of its benefits. Um, so now, as you can see, we have a dynamic amount of workers. Um, and this is unlike other executors, although with Celery, they have been working with an auto scaler to actually maneuver those executors and make scale in and out. But it's just not going to be as quick and like well done as the Kubernetes executor, since Kubernetes is actually handling all of that sort of logic itself. And with the Celery executor, you would have to actually create another component to actually do that scaling. Also, we now avoid wasted resources. So now, as I said, most other executors have a static amount of workers. Um, all those resources, when there's not, um, when the Airflow workers don't have tasks scheduled on them, essentially it's just wasting those resources. So you could time it so essentially all your tasks, um, all your workers have a task running on them as much as possible, but there is probably going to be some layover where a task is not being run on one of those workers and the resources are being wasted. But since the Kubernetes executor deletes those pods or those airflow workers now, um, you essentially avoid resources minimally. Also, you have a lot of fault tolerance now because if a worker breaks or just has a bug in it, essentially it will throw an error and Kubernetes will see that and just delete that Airflow worker. You'll still be able to access the logs and debug it, but it will actually free up those resources to either have Airflow reschedule that Airflow worker and try that task again, or it could even free up those resources for some other process running in your Kubernetes cluster. So now you have highly available workers. Um, and lastly, the, a great benefit of the Kubernetes executor is the reduced stress on the scheduler. And this is due to its use of edge-driven triggers with the Kubernetes executor by the use of the Kubernetes watch API. So what does this actually mean? Um, in distributed systems, um, there needs to be a way to check changes in state. So like in the case of Kubernetes, um, if a pod is goes from running to a failed state, so it's processing and then it just stops because it failed for some reason. So you need to be able to determine those changes in state and that's how, that's where events come in. Events are the ways to actually notify of those changes in state. So there's two ways of checking these changes in state in a distributed system and that's edge-driven triggers and level-driven triggers. 
So level-driven triggers just periodically query somewhere to check that change in state and see if it's differed from what it was previously. And edge-driven triggers actually um, wait, actually use a broadcast and listener pattern. So essentially, now the Airflow scheduler is able to use that broadcast and listener pattern with the Kubernetes Watch API. And it doesn't have to constantly query the um, Airflow database to see those changes in state for its tasks because Airflow itself needs events in a sense where it needs to track the state of those Airflow workers because it itself is a distributed system with Airflow workers actually running separately from like the scheduler and such. So with the use of edge driven triggers, it actually reduces the scheduler stress a lot, especially when you scale out and start running a lot of tasks parallelly. Okay, deploying Airflow on Kubernetes. Um, we actually deploy Airflow on Kubernetes with Helm. Um, if you're not sure what Helm is, it's a package manager for Kubernetes. It um, can deploy and manage multiple manifests as one unit. Um, a manifest is essentially a YAML file that contains the declarative configuration for the Kubernetes resource you want to create, essentially. So um, let's, you might be wondering, why don't you just deploy all those manifests singly instead of all at one time? Um, that's because, say you have a big deployment, like we have Airflow, you have the scheduler, the web server, and the database. Um, there's really no point in deploying one at a time because essentially it's not going to function as a system unless all the components are deployed and all the microservices and pieces. So Helm enables you to actually do that and then manage those manifests and Kubernetes resources as one unit. Helm also uses templating to actually templatize these manifests. It uses Golang temp templating to be specific. Um, but essentially, it templates all the a lot of values or whichever values you choose in those manifests to deploy your um, system, whether it be Airflow or some other system. Um, and it's, you can easily now you manage essentially one YAML file for all those manifests, and that YAML file actually um, will fill in the values that you templated in those manifests. And why do you? want to use this. So say if there's a value in the manifest for the scheduler, and it actually rolls over and should be the same um, and should be also changed somewhere in the web server because the web server references that value. So it should sync up. So that's where you throw in the templating and it would then you'd assign the value you want it in the single values file that you're managing with Helm. And then Helm would fill in the templates in those two spots that you sort of desired in your manifest. So now you're not having to go change things multiple times and having to remember to change things multiple times in all those manifests for those deployments. So now I wanna go over how we actually deploy um, inside of our cluster and like sort of the architecture of our deployments for Airflow. Um, so in non-prod, you can see we have a pod for the scheduler, the web server and that database. Um, so, as you can tell, we run everything in Kubernetes. Essentially, that blue box represents a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so the reason we deploy the database in Kubernetes is more to save money because Kubernetes is very, really good at scaling and um, actually using the minimum amount of resources you need. Um, and essentially, we're not worried too much about losing the state as much in non-prod. Um, it wouldn't disturb anything in terms of production because um, we're using that more as a testing environment. Obviously, it's on prod. Um, so in our production, as you can see, though, we actually keep our database outside of the cluster. And this is for safety, definitely, because it's Kubernetes is definitely becoming more reliant as running stateful sort of systems inside of itself. But um, it's still not super ready for that. So um, we just use an AWS RDS actually to for our production environment. And this brings me to the reason why we use Terraform to automate this deployment with Helm. And if you're curious what Terraform is, um, it's just an infrastructure as the code tool to deploy either cloud resources, or it can also deploy Kubernetes resources or even Helm deployments. So essentially Terraform enables us to conditionally deploy easily conditionally deploy this database in, in either inside Kubernetes 
or as an AWS RDS. So now we can, in a single script of automation, handle the case where we either want to run in production essentially or non-prod. And you can also create all the connections you need um, and the IAM roles and the security groups to actually connect your database from either AWS or some other cloud provider to your Kubernetes cluster. So Terraform enables us to kind of do that in a single place and actually maintain all that automation to create our Airflow deployments. Now onto the technologies that are actually enabled from this integration. Probably the most important technology enabled is the Kubernetes pod operator. So essentially, um, as you can guess, probably the Kubernetes pod operator just creates an Airflow worker, which then runs a Kubernetes pod. Um, so the arguments for this actual operator pretty much match a declarative configuration file, the YAML file for a pod. Um, not in terms of format, but in terms of the values you specify. So you specify something like the namespace, which is just a virtual cluster in Kubernetes and the way you sort of organize your resources. Say you want to make one for different teams and they can only kind of manage their resources in their namespace. Um, you also specify the image. So the image running in the container running in your pod. So we're just running Python and a Python image here. And then we're running with the commands um, Python, print hello world. So essentially we're just printing hello world, a simple sort of uh, task. So you can also apply labels, um, just a key value pair. Uh, it enables you to further uh, make it easier to sort of find that pod within all the existing pods and query it. Um, and then just the name of the pod and then the stuff you'd see in a normal operator like a DAG, um, the DAG equals DAG thing. Um, so before I move on from this, I actually wanted to show you guys what's actually going on because you're probably thinking it's like the Kubernetes executor diagram I showed you where the Airflow worker comes up and it somehow runs within that Airflow worker, but that's not actually what's going on. So essentially, say the Airflow scheduler wants to schedule a task that's running with the Kubernetes pod operator. So imagine it hits the API server here. I just didn't add it but then it creates that Airflow worker. And then now the Airflow worker actually spawns a, another pod. And it's just essentially throughout this task tracking to make sure this pod runs successfully. So this might seem kind of like extra work for no reason, but this allows your task to be in its own environment now. So you can make your specific Docker image from the, for the task and you don't have to have all the sort of dependencies for an Airflow worker or if you have um, the Airflow task dependencies for the other tasks in your Airflow worker image. Now you don't have to worry about those. You have your own task image. So now you just have the Python container and then it will finish. And then the Airflow worker will notice that and then it will finish. And then that task is finished. And it doesn't take long at all for a pod to start and for this one to spawn. It takes under a second, very quick. Okay, so now that we have control with Kubernetes. Um, so essentially since we are using the Kubernetes pod operator, we have the power of Kubernetes at our hands. So what can we actually do? We can add taints and tolerations and node affinities. These enable you to actually make dedicated nodes on your Kubernetes cluster for dedicated um, tasks or pods on your Kubernetes cluster. So say if you wanna run Spark, you want a more powerful node, you can use taints, tolerations, and node affinities to actually make that work. Um, I'm gonna go over further on how you do this because I feel like it's an important concept, especially in a big data processing sort of pipeline tool. Okay, so you can also use sidecar containers for logs. So as I said earlier, a container represents uh, essentially, a, or a pod represents either a single container or multiple containers. So you can actually put another container in your task pod that's spawned by the Kubernetes pod operator and mount a volume that is shared between those two containers and then shoot the logs into that volume from the actual container that's running the task and then have that sidecar container shoot those logs to some other logging server you wanna use instead of um, maybe like the default one that Airflow uses just natively. Also, you have persistent data volumes now. So if you're running a task, you can essentially just write your output of one part of, of the task to a volume 
and then you could actually reuse that volume in the next task and just read it locally. Um, if there's any chance that you're writing it somewhere external, um, this might save you some time because um, it would just be able to, the task would now just be able to read locally and get all the data you've processed from the previous task. Also, now you have perpetual task environments. So essentially, you have your same environment for that task. So you're not worried about having maybe another task dependency change and then the airflow worker with the dependencies for both of those possibly colliding and causing an error in an old task that had its dependencies loaded. Um, so this saves a lot less worry in terms of possibly breaking um, the airflow workers or old tasks when you add the dependencies for a new task you sort of implemented. And now you also can use pod security policies. So a pod security policy actually enables you to add a lot more security to your container. You can run as a weaker Linux user, or you force the pod to run as a, the containers in the pod to run as a weaker Linux user. Um, you can put more file group restrictions on your file system and things like that. You can also easily track system level metrics now of your tasks. So we essentially have the power of Kubernetes um, in terms of getting metrics on those pods. So now we can see how much CPU each task takes approximately, how much memory it's using. You can also actually restrict those task pods that are running um, based on how much CPU and memory they can use. Um, so that's a very useful thing. Maybe you don't want a task hogging all the memory that, that it tends to do. Um, you can actually just put this in a declarative configuration specifying it has these limits for CPU and memory and it can't, the container can't like actually physically grab and use more CPU or memory past that limit you specify. And also ex easily expose task interfaces. So a good example of where this could be used is, um, well, I can give an example where we use it. Um, we run Spark a lot um, within our Airflow um, workflows. So essentially when we were in Spark and we're debugging, we sometimes want to bring up the Air, uh, the Spark history server to look at look more inside as to what's going on with Spark and the executors and such. So now with the simple command um, from the Kubernetes CLI tool, um, you can just expose that interface for the um, Spark history server locally. So you could do this for other tasks, interfaces that they might have. Um, and it's very easy, just a simple CLI command. You also have development portability now because you're building those images for those tasks locally. So, you know, since the images are being pulled and now when they're running in production with Airflow, because it uses that Kubernetes pod operator to pull and run that image, you know it's going to be run the same as it is locally when you run it because the image verifies and guarantees essentially that the platform that the code is running on within that image is the same platform every time. Okay, before I move on from the technologies, I wanted to specify one more thing. Um, you're probably thinking right now, Kubernetes, the Kubernetes pod operator is the only thing you're going to be able to really use to take advantage of all these Kubernetes benefits, but that's not exactly the case. Um, so, a while back, we found sort of more of a hidden uh, parameter um, in the base operator called the executor config. This basically enables you to define configurations depending on the executor. So, for example, you could simply here put this celery executor and just um, give some celery specific configuration. But we use this a lot for Kubernetes too because. Also because it is in that base operator, now all operators have the ability to actually use that configuration. So that's why I wanted to specify it's basically saying not using the Kubernetes pod operator, it's not the only thing that will actually benefit from the Kubernetes executor. Essentially you can specify most of these benefits I went over in the previous slide um, in any operator. The only thing that you'll be missing is essentially that benefit of using a containerized task where it has that perpetual environment because you'll still be using that Airflow worker image um, 
but you can specify a lot of things. So like here we specify an annotation, which is just a configuration in the, a configuration option in that declarative configuration for a Kubernetes pod. Um, this enables us actually to add an IAM role to our pod and gives us access to our S3 bucket um, to get the data actually and read it in our Airflow pipeline. How did we actually adapt our DAG development to this um, kind of new technology stack? Um, so there were a few requirements we had to fulfill and I'm gonna go over those with you right now and I'm gonna go over a solution we use to essentially sort of get rid of as much technical debt um, as, as we could possibly with um, as we started using the Kubernetes executor because it definitely does require a bit more things if you did transition to it, but um, there's an easy way to automate it to make it very reusable because it's not a lot of volume in terms of, there's not like a heavy volume of extra requirements you have to do, but it is something. So you want to find a way, obviously we wanted to find a way to automate that and make it, the automation as reusable as possible from DAG project to DAG project. And we also actually came up with a benefit as a result of having Kubernetes in our arsenal of technologies within Airflow now. Um, and we added a feature to our Airflow and Kubernetes deployment. So really quick, I'll go over that. So essentially uh, the benefit or the feature we made was using Kubernetes for a configuration instead of Airflow variables. Um, we were going to originally go with Airflow variables, but we noticed that um, essentially the airflow variables, whenever you reference one in your DAG, it actually makes an API call to the metadata, data, metadata database. <laughs> so, um, so this actually can stress out the actual like kind of compiling of the DAGs because it's constantly going to be querying that airflow variables from that database for all the times you reference a configuration. And also just the airflow variables UI was kind of messy with all the configurations kind of jumbled together. So we were kind of afraid we might actually change the wrong configuration for something else. Um, so we ended up using Kubernetes config maps simply with a, a Python script that made an API call to actually get config maps from Kubernetes. And if you're wondering what a config map is, it's just a resource to get configuration from Kubernetes. So it essentially stores a configuration file in Kubernetes. So we just queried those and those are actually created with the name. So we'd have the name of that config map, which would essentially be that DAG's name. Um, and then we would just read that and get the configurations or whenever we wanna change the configurations, we would just change the resource in Kubernetes. Um, and we found this to be a pretty effective solution solution for our configuration. Um, okay, now I'm gonna move on to the requirements we had to fulfill to actually integrate this technology into our DAG development. Um, first thing was the Kubernetes RBAC. So Kubernetes uses, uses role-based access control to actually use authorization or fulfill authorization within the cluster. So it's just like a user, there's a user, there's a role, and essentially the roles are bound to that user. And depending on what roles are bound is what the user can essentially do within the cluster. Um, and in terms of actual pods um, or resources within the cluster, you're probably gonna wanna call the API from Kubernetes and access some resources, other resources in Kubernetes from those pods internally in the cluster. In that case, Instead of users as the entity, it's a service account and you would just attach that service account to the pod. The service account would have certain roles bound to it and that would essentially give that service account access in some sort or fashion based on the role to the Kubernetes cluster. So we had to find a way to make sure Airflow, the actual deployment inside had the permissions to deploy pods in different namespaces so we could create those workers with the API calls um, and we actually, at, originally, we're starting out by just organizing our DAGs in different namespaces. So it's kind of visually appealing to see only in that namespace, these pods for this DAG are running. Um, so we had to also create the namespace and give Airflow the correct permissions and roles for creating pods in that namespace. And also reading those config maps, because as I said, we use those config maps as a resource for configuration. 
Secondly, we had to actually automatically create the IAM roles to access our cloud storage to actually get the data for our DAGs to process. So for that, um, pretty, pretty straightforward problem, but we wanted to find a way to essentially automate how to create these roles and how to create these Kubernetes RBAC policies um, for our DAGs. Um, every time we say ran CI CD to deploy, actually deploy that DAG to Kubernetes. Um, so our solution to actually automate this um, in a reusable fashion was using Terraform because as I said, Terraform can automate the deployment and management of cloud resources, Kubernetes resources, and a lot more. Um, so we just use Terraform to actually create those roles, um, the namespaces for those DAGs, different DAGs, um, the IAM roles and policies we needed to actually access um, S3 and all those cloud storage um, points of contact. Um, we also Created, we're thinking about creating pod networking policies to enable minimum contact from pods to pods as in, unless it's actually needed. So then we'd specify that in the networking policy. Also, what we're going to be implementing soon is actually creating our Datadog dashboards for alerts and metrics on those DAGs within that Terraform as well. Um, so this would enable us to automate the actual creation of the dashboards and it would set up our sort of alerts and metrics for that DAG instantaneously, which is kind of the one thing manual we've actually had to do. Um, so we actually do this just in a single Terraform script. You can create all these and you can actually easily create the Terraform to make it very configurable. So you could essentially just use that Terraform either as a module or just copy it in that other DAG project and just instead specify maybe you have some different buckets you want to um, enter or have access to, or maybe you just want to change the name of those Kubernetes resources, but essentially they're going to be the same type of like RBAC roles for Kubernetes. You're just going to want to create a pod um, and such. So it's very, the amount of technical debt added um, is actually not as, um, it's not very like high in volume and it's very, and it has the capability to be made um, and automated to be very um, sort of reusable, like at least the solutions to actually solve the fulfillment of the requirements to run Airflow on your Kubernetes. Um, we also actually template the environments with CI CD because we have some DAGs that are essentially the same, but um, other teams use that same DAG and manage, um, use the same DAG to process data, but their data is coming from a different source. So we have essentially the same DAG running for just essentially different data sources. Um, so we use CI CD to easily essentially template everything in those DAG projects. So you just make a single file with the specifications for where to get that team's data and maybe rename some things a bit. Um, and essentially you could easily redeploy your DAGs um, for other teams if they're going to be using the same DAG. Um, we use GitLab CI CD if you were interested actually. Okay, now I wanted to go over one of the features I talked about earlier in Kubernetes. I think this is a very important feature um, if you're going to be running Airflow on Kubernetes because Airflow actually does pipelines for big data, like usually big data processing or just regular, not big data, small data. <laughs> but um, so this feature actually enables you to make dedicated nodes for dedicated tasks. So it makes sure you're running those very compute heavy um, airflow tasks on the like strong and powerful, like highly buffed up nodes um, and make sure you're running the more simple sort of operators in airflow on the more weaker nodes. So like a S3 key sensor or the actual sensors themselves aren't as compute heavy. So you'd schedule those on a weaker node. So to, to go over this, I actually wanted to do a visual example as to what's really going on conceptually with Taint's tolerations and node affinities. So I've made this scenario where we have two pods, a Python, one pod's going to be running a Python and one pod's going to be running Spark. Um, and there's two nodes. Um, there's a blue node in the Kubernetes cluster. And that's assume that's the weaker node with less compute and there's a red node and assume that has the stronger compute. So right now, this is the possible ways these pods could be scheduled. You could have the spark on the weaker node or the stronger red node. 
and the same thing for Python. So we're going to go through how we could apply change tolerations and node affinities and actually optimize the scheduling of these so they're scheduled to the, the nodes they should be scheduled to, to optimize their basically compute. So first things first, um, we're going to add a taint. Um, what a taint actually does, it's just a key value pair. It prevents pods without a toleration for that taint to be scheduled on it in Kubernetes. So right now there's no tolerations in the configurations for the pods. They just have that default configuration. We're assuming that's there. Um, so nothing's getting, none of these pods will possibly get scheduled to this node. So how are we going to actually take the next step and at least allow the spark to be scheduled on it? So we are going to add that toleration, which is essentially just a key value pair itself as well. That should match that key value pair and say the spark pod tolerates that taint. So it can be scheduled on that more heavier compute node. So almost done, but not quite, as you can see, the spark pod can still be scheduled on that weaker node. So what is the next step to actually getting to dedicating this spark pod to this more heavier compute and node, um, the red node. Um, so that will bring us to node affinity. So first things first, we're going to apply a label to this node. A label is just going to be the same key value pair. It's just for an example, but um, essentially, as I described before, it's just a way to describe a pod, but it can also be used for things like node affinities. So now we have that label on that node and nothing changed. That's because there's no actually affinity yet described in the pod, so let's add that affinity. So now we have the node affinity for Fugel's bar. So now we know that spark pod will be scheduled on that heavier compute node. Essentially, this affinity forces that spark pod to be scheduled on a node with the label that matches the specified label in the node affinity. So label for equals bar and node affinity for equals bar. So you might be wondering, why don't we just use node affinities because that will force this pod to be scheduled on this node with that label. And the reason we have to use taints is because the taint actually will prevent other weaker sort of um, applications to be scheduled on this node. So if we didn't have this taint, essentially, this Python pod could still be scheduled on this stronger node and be wasting the more stronger compute where the spark should be constantly scheduled on. Now I'm going to go over a way you can actually kind of abstract all these concepts because it's kind of a lot taking in the whole kind of ecosystem of Kubernetes at once. And that's kind of what you have to do when you move to Airflow and Kubernetes. You have to deal with all the features of it and it can be a sharp learning curve sometimes. So there's a lot to understand. Um, as I showed you all those features before, those probably weren't even half the features. Those were just ones that stood out to me. Um, so how do you actually, there's actually a way to sort of abstract these from your DAG developers though, because they should be focusing on the actual big data processing and stuff that's going on within that DAG and not all these Kubernetes and infrastructure pieces of the um, of their work, I guess. Um, so. Typically, in most companies, I imagine um, they're SREs to manage your infrastructure. Um, we're moving to that kind of concept. We're kind of doing a hybrid thing right now, but we're in the process of moving to that at Nielsen. But um, so you should right away go tell them if you want to start doing um, Airflow and Kubernetes to start implementing some dynamic webhooks. This will help you actually um, abstract all these kind of complex ideas within Kubernetes and the, implementing these more complex features, like I just showed you taints, tolerations, and node affinities. Um, the example made it pretty understandable, but to be honest, um, having to go through that a lot and define that in your DAG, and you'll see a lot of configuration in that Kubernetes pod operator a lot now, it can get pretty clunky with all that configuration. So the solution to that is dynamic webhooks. There are two types of dynamic webhooks in Kubernetes. You can do a validating webhook, which enables extra validation to your Kubernetes API calls. Or you can, which essentially says, oh, this pod does not have this label. I will not accept that in the Kubernetes cluster. And with mutating webhooks, you can actually forcefully modify a resources configuration as it's submitted to the cluster. So say it has that label Foo equals bar like we showed earlier. And as a result of having this label, it will add 
the node affinities and the tolerations to that pod. So that is where mutating webhooks come in. So the idea here is if you don't want to have to forcefully add that configuration for like say the node affinity and toleration every time you're running a spark job in your Airflow DAG. Now you can essentially tell the SRE team to make a tool that will essentially allow you to just put a label. Let's say the app of that um, pod going to be running is equal to spark. So you put that key value pair as the label of that pod and they could implement a mutating webhook that will automatically add the more complex configuration of the node affinity and tolerations for that pod to force it to be scheduled on those compute specific nodes. So the mutating webhook will actually enable them to take care of adding that more complex configuration and you won't have to really learn how that works if you don't want to kind of go through that sharp learning curve with all your um, DAG developers or big data developers. And then also it allows you to make your DAG like actual the code in it to look a lot more clean because it's not just clunked up with a lot of configuration. Um, we also use validating webhooks actually to force teams to label their team name or their cost center on their um, pods to track compute and the costs that they're actually using um, in the Kubernetes clusters. Um, okay, so finally, what's next? Airflow 2.0. With Airflow 2.0, we're looking forward to a couple of cool features. Um, first off, there's going to be a feature where you can directly apply pod manifest in the Kubernetes pod operator. Because as I said, that configuration in the Kubernetes pod operator pretty much directly maps to a declarative YAML files configuration for pod. So we would prefer to possibly specify the location of a declarative manifest file for that pod that's going to be submitted instead of having to put a bunch of configuration in our, our DAG, essentially. Um, also the Kubernetes Spark operator. It's essentially going to be a tool that allows you to use the Kubernetes Spark operator on Airflow. Um, the naming's kind of weird um, because operators are also a thing in Airflow and they're also a thing in Kubernetes. Um, but if you want to get more details on this subject, um, there's actually a talk at the meetup that's going to happen in Bangalore tomorrow. Um, I think in a couple hours, I think it's at 1 AM EST at least, but that's EST. That's my time. Um, so that will be going on soon. It's actually going to be held by two members of Nielsen, um, Roy and Ite. So check that out if you want to learn more about Spark on Kubernetes, because we do that a lot. So we're very much looking forward to watching how that talk goes um, and learning from it. Also, lastly, we're looking forward to some new official um, images, Docker images and Helm charts for Airflow. Um, currently, what we use works great, um, but it'd be more kind of uh, reassuring when we update the images um, according to what's on the repos we use now um, was maintained and managed by some like organization like Apache. But uh, both of what we use now, which is the stable Helm chart for Airflow, and then also the Puckle Docker image work um, fine. I've actually contributed a bit to the um, stable Helm chart um, and have been kind of following that as it's developed. But I'm, we're looking forward to kind of having a more stable kind of versions of those so we can be more confident when we update in production and such. Okay, and that's my talk. Um, I hope you guys learned from this. And if you have any questions more about how we're doing this in production or anything, um, now's the time. <laughs> Some questions in the chat. Okay, cool. So uh, let's go, I'll go through them. So uh, let's see, do you pack all the DAGs into the base image while containerize it, or do you use git sync to upload your changes to the cluster, and how do you compare one to the, to the other? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so actually, we use an S3 sync. Um, so we were going to do a git sync. I added that. That was actually what I added, the feature added to the stable home chart. But, um, we instead went with a S3 sync. So essentially we have a sidecar container in our Airflow scheduler and web server that is constant, 
currently running AWS S3 Sync in a bucket location in S3 where we keep our DAGs um, because we didn't want to use Git because we wanted the DAGs to stay more towards the application code and not just a giant, having a giant repo with all those um, DAGs. Um, so in our CICD, we actually just copy the DAGs to that location in S3. And then essentially the sidecar container in the Airflow scheduler and Airflow web pod just syncs up with that bucket and adds those new DAGs. Okay. Um, Next question, you must maintain the nodes layer in order to avoid wasted resources, like autoscaler, right? Question mark. Um, nodes layer. Um, we don't really do anything like that. When I was talking about wasted resources, I meant that the nodes for other executors are static. So essentially, if a task isn't scheduled, like if you just spin up a Celery um, executor on like just, you can still do Celery Executor on Kubernetes. Um, you'll see two pods just sitting there with required resources. I meant more as in avoiding wasted resources by since the pods are deleted upon finish of that task and then they're not scheduled again until Airflow has another task to schedule. So I meant more in terms of avoiding wasted resources in terms of the downtime of your actual workers now. So it, they're essentially transient workers. So they're up when they need to be up and they're down when they're no, not needed. Thank you. So the next question, have you experienced race conditions with Helm? Mm, uh, yes, 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 actually. Um, so inside, sometimes when we delete our deployment um, and then redeploy quickly, um, the persistent volumes in that um, deployment from the old one um, so, for example, we use a persistent volume to share the logs across um, with EFS. Uh, but so we use that persistent volume within Kubernetes, and we mount that within the Airflow scheduler and the web server for the logs. But when we delete that Helm deployment, sometimes that persistent volume will still exist, and then when we deploy again, it's still be deleting, and it'll be like this already exists. So we have we have actually experienced that race condition. Um, so we kind of avoid and give it like. 30 seconds before we redeploy. All right, next question. When you run a Spark job, is the actual job running on the same pod as the worker that triggered it, or are you using an EM operator slash fabric operator, et cetera, to trigger the job on a different machine? So we actually use Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, if you just look that up, you should find some documentation on how it works. So essentially, we just use, we just, create a pod with all the Spark dependencies, and then it calls Spark Submit. And for the master, you actually specify your Kubernetes cluster, and then it will create a driver pod, and that driver pod for Spark will actually create a series of executor pods, depending on how many you want to specify. So we're actually just using Spark Submit um, currently to run our Kubernetes. Um, so we call the Kubernetes pod operator, we pass in, um, essentially the command, the Spark submit command, and it executes that and that Kubernetes pod, and that spawns the Spark job. And then we wait for that Spark job to finish, and then that Kubernetes job finishes according to the exit code on that um, created Spark um, on Kubernetes pods. Okay, next question. Any benchmark for this implementation? Any scalability issues, please? Um, so far, no, we haven't really super low tested it uh, a ton. Um, like we just have probably eight DAGs running in production, although we're not like, like, I don't know if you saw, I think it was Airbnb, they have like 30, a ton of DAGs running in production. We don't really maintain that much at all. Um, so currently it's been our team doing like the sort of, um, trust fall on using this. Um, and we've been doing all the sort of experimentation, but we haven't really load tested it, but the only problem um, we've actually seen is something with an EFS sync issue or an EFS issue in terms of writing to that persistent volume, but no scalability issues um, so far. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, next question. In, in the non-prod environment, do you have any personal dev environment? For users, oops, hold on, for users to test their DAG before pushing their DAG to pre-prod? If yes, how do you maintain this kind of configs and especially the credentials? 
Mm, so, I mean, we just have their, um, essentially our environments are set up. We have our non-prod and that's where they test all the developers, test all their DAGs. And then we have a pre-prod cluster and a prod cluster. So um, the credentials, um, so how we actually sort credentials, um, I'm not sure what you actually mean by credentials for a DOM, like a developer centric. Um, Airflow instance, essentially. But for um, connecting and security, we do, um, so we have Google OAuth um, attached. It's kind of more complex, but with the Ingress, you can use Google OAuth, the Kubernetes Ingress. So um, any member of our company with the Nielsen email will be able to connect, but then we further limit that because our Ingress is in AWS um, ALB. We can actually restrict who can connect to it by like IP um, by messing with the security groups on the AWS ingress. Um, so only our teams can access, only the teams or the people in Nielsen we specify can actually access our Airflow instance. But we have no like, um, what is that? Personal development environment for users, I guess. They just test their DAGs in non-prod. So we have a CICD pipeline for both non-prod and prod. And for non-prod, it just pushes the DAG to the bucket for a non-prod and it will run it accordingly. Okay, uh, next question. And could you go deeper into how you are collecting metrics with an airflow from Kubernetes? Are you using an agent on each of the task pods or are your metrics more infrastructure focused? Um, so in terms of airflow metrics themselves, like on their actual components, um, Currently, we've just been um, actually checking. We actually, actually, I did. We have the we pass in the Datadog API key, and it sends like scheduler heartbeats. So if a scheduler heartbeat happens to, if it's not sending a heartbeat, obviously we'll get like an alert, like the scheduler's down. Or um, yeah, but in terms, that's in terms of actual component centric for the Airflow component centric metric, but metrics. With our DAGs, um, for our DAGs, actual um, sort of alerts and metrics, we just sort of run a Kubernetes cloud operator. You could also just use a batch operator, but that just runs an API call and basically says you've started this stage in your DAG, and if it doesn't start in a certain amount of time, it sends an alert. Um, and then, um, yeah, but we're going to start integrating Prometheus into our clusters very soon, and we're going to start taking metrics from that um, for Airflow and for that. Okay. Next question. Do you have any sample setup template for Airflow with the Cades executor? Um, currently, uh, we don't have one publicly available, but we could definitely, if enough people want it, I could definitely make that happen. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, this is more of a basic uh, airflow question. With the cube executor versus cube pod operator, when to use one over the other? Okay, so essentially, they're a little bit more different than that. The Kubernetes executor is used with the Kubernetes pod operator. So the Kubernetes executor is used every time you schedule a task or an operator in Airflow. So all it does is make your workers now created in these new pods. So as you saw. In the, my diagram earlier, there was Airflow Worker, Airflow Worker. There's three of them. Um, so the Kubernetes pod operator just takes a step ahead of that. And instead of running in that Airflow Worker image with all the dependencies of the Airflow Worker image, it creates a new pod um, with the task specific code and dependencies um, and actually kind of makes you not have to worry about the dependencies of the other dependencies of the Airflow Worker. So when to actually use the Kubernetes pod operator, I would um, uh, I would say if you want to, if you haven't, if you've already developed things um, for Airflow, like you already have an operator running, you've already running some part of your DAG with another operator, I would just leave it the way it is and use that executor config to add more specific um, Kubernetes configuration. But if you're creating new like parts in your DAG or different tasks and going to be using another operator, I would just start using, start leaning towards more towards using the Kubernetes pod operator because now 
you can simply just make the Docker image for the task you want to run and and not have to worry about the dependent other dependencies in the Airflow worker and adding the dependencies to that Airflow worker. So you just have that image that you create for those new tasks and then you just run that image. So it defeats that step of having to add the dependencies for that new task you're going to implement inside the Airflow worker image. Um, yeah, so I would say more towards new tasks you're implementing. Okay, last two questions. Can you speak more about, now that you, you talked about metrics, but there's another about metrics, I'll let you decide how to answer okay. this. Can you speak more about metrics collection for Airflow Kubernetes? What specifically are you collecting from Datadog? Um, Datadog's more for our, uh, uh, well, so if you actually pass in the Datadog API key, you can get actual metrics from your Airflow components. So you can get like scheduler heartbeats and you can get a couple other ones. We only use the scheduler um, heartbeats though. Um, but we also use Datadog for our Airflow DAGs in terms of alerts on those. So um, if a task doesn't start when it should have started already, um, we'll get an alert in Datadog. And we do that just by API calls um, within the uh, within Airflow. Um, yeah, so we're still kind of building up our metrics systems around Airflow. Um, so we're going to end up going with Prometheus because now there's actually been some great integrations added for running um, for integrating Airflow on Kubernetes with Prometheus. So that's probably going to be one of the big next steps we're going to take um, in terms of adding to our sort of stack behind Airflow with like monitoring and such. Next question, why would you use uh, an Airflow operator versus a uh, case negative uh, workflow tool like Argo workflow? Any benchmarks done on this? Uh, question mark. Am I mistaken on the use cases? Apple to orange is question mark. Okay. Yeah. So um, I didn't actually look at Argo myself, but our tech lead looked at Argo. Um, so my manager. Um, and he said, I don't remember what they were specifically. Um, I can actually find out this information and post it later in the Slack channel. But Argo was missing some features that we needed in terms of actually, uh, in terms of its workflow orchestration kind of. Um, actual capabilities. So that's the reason we ended up going with Airflow. Um, yeah, because Argo looked pretty promising because it's built like with the purpose of running on Kubernetes and Airflow was kind of just moving. At the time, we probably started this back in November is when we started really digging into this stuff. Um, so Airflow was also kind of scary because there are people doing like Airflow and Kubernetes, but it wasn't like we weren't sure how many people were actually running it in production and things. But Argo was built specifically for Kubernetes, so it looked pretty promising, but it was missing a couple core sort of features that we needed. So that's the reason. I can try to find out what those are and post them in like one of the Slack channels as well. Okay, and the final question is, uh, what are the biggest pain points with the way you guys do this what do you wish was better or easier? Okay, good question. <laughs> um, I always hate to look at what I did badly, but now I'm gonna. <laughs> um, let's think. Uh, so probably the thing we did worse was uh, um, just trying to, when we initially started trying to figure out what Helm chart we were gonna use, um, I switched between this stable home chart and Bitnami's like three times. And it was very annoying because I'd find out the configuration to run it with Bitnami, but then we'd want to add a feature to it, which I didn't, I, I mean, we might have been able to do it, but that was pretty early in my career. So I might not have known how to do it at that time. So then we switched to the stable home chart and the stable home chart wouldn't have some features. So eventually just digging down and determining what actual sources of the tools we were going to use was definitely very tough. Um, the biggest pain point is probably this bug we've been sort of um, seeing where our airflow scheduler will sometimes have trouble. Um, or the, for airflow logs, when it writes those, I think it's in the scheduler, but um, 
it has a lot of trouble actually writing to EFS sometimes. So it says it won't have permission to write into that mounted volume when they pod and essentially we have to restart the container. We have a solution to fix the bug temporarily in terms of just restarting the containers. Because that's another really positive point. Um, you can restart the scheduler in the web server and they'll be back up in like 30 seconds and it's like nothing happened. Um, but yeah, that was the biggest pain point and it still is probably that bug in the scheduler that's about writing logs to EFS. Um, I can probably come up with more if I think about this longer. Um, maybe I'll post in the Slack channel in a bit um, as to what more sort of pain points and what we did wrong. <laughs> Okay, well, that's all the questions uh, for today. Thanks, Michael, for your time and your effort. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to do a few, uh, uh, before we close out today, I'm just going to have a few reminders for our listeners. Uh, tomorrow we will have two blocks, tomorrow, Wednesday, one hosted by the Bangalore meetup from 4 to 7 UTC, which is morning for Asia, and a second one, uh, hosted by the Bay Area Meetup from 16 to 19 UTC, which is in the morning for America. Uh, recordings for today's sessions are available in Crowdcast. To watch the previous talks, select them by clicking on the word schedule in the upper left-hand corner of the Crowdcast window and pick from the drop-down menu. Uh, <clears throat> remember to check out, the uh, last point here is to remember to check out the virtual swag bag there are offers for free books and discounts, as well as the opportunity to win a really nice set of Bose noise-canceling headphones, 700s. Thank you. Have a good day.